Good morning, Grace Church. Ah, my name is Kip Martin. I'm a ministry intern here, and I am just so glad to be here with you all this morning. Uh, but as they, as they uh, go out real quick, give the band a hand. You know, our, 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 our regular, our foundation, our rock, our, our guitar players, and then Bill and Emily stepping in to just make our worship experience incredible. I am honored and privileged to be able to bring the message to you this morning. So let's jump right into our message today. Last week, if you were here, you heard from Michael Mosley, one of our missionary partners, because it was Send Conference Week. However, as Emily said, now we're back to our regularly scheduled program, continuing with our Sunday message series we've been in called Rebuild, as we walk through the story of Nehemiah and the Bible. In case you're just joining us for the first time, here's a quick recap of where we've been. Ready? It's going to be real quick. Four, more, four weeks in like 30 seconds. Nehemiah, who was a Jew, was at the time the cupbearer to the pagan king of Persia, Artaxerxes. He receives news that the walls of Jerusalem are destroyed and its people are in trouble. Seventy years prior to this, Jerusalem had been overtaken and many of the Jewish people were in exile in many places, Persia being one of those. And many were still living in Jerusalem amongst the ruins. Now, Nehemiah has never actually lived in Jerusalem. He was born in exile, and he has no experience at all as a builder. But through prayer, he feels as though God is giving him the mission to go rebuild the walls of Jerusalem to help his people who are depressed, helpless, and left without protection from enemies. So he gets permission from the Persian king to go, And he heads the 900 miles or so away to Jerusalem. He assesses the damage to the walls and then begins to build a team to help with the physical rebuild to help that start. So far in the story, things have gone smoothly. Nehemiah hasn't had too many bumps in the road until now. So today we're going to talk about opposition to rebuilding. Now, I don't know where you need some restoration or rebuilding in your own life. It may or may not be actual walls or roofs after the hurricane. There's been a lot of that needed around here. But there are so many other secret parts of ourselves that need help, to be, that we need help to be all God intends us to be. Wouldn't you agree? You know, it could be addiction. It could be homelessness, jobless, relationships, any number of things. The list goes on and on. Well, if that's so, God will be your helper in your personal rebuild. But I can assure you uh, that you will face opposition from the outside when you try to change anything, even when it's good change and godly and healthy and all the rest. Someone is not going to like it. Can you say amen? Amen. So here's the deal. Today, we actually see the first glimpse of struggle on the horizon for Nehemiah's rebuild. But I think how Nehemiah overcomes opposition can help us overcome our own opposition. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So first, let's go to the scripture passages for today. Sit back and relax. Listen up. It's going to take a little bit, but it's a really good story. I'm going to jump around a little, just a bit from Nehemiah 2 to Nehemiah 6, uh, sort of like when you were in college and you got the cliff notes to give you the highlights of the book, not the whole thing. But So this is going to be a flyover. Now, in your free time, I encourage you to read the whole thing. Uh, But meanwhile, today, sit back and listen. Dun, dun, dun. Now, here's what Nehemiah does. So, we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead, and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand, and held a weapon in the other, and each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet 
stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. Okay, so after this, then Sambalat and Tobiah, they send a few cease and desist messages, like stop the building, and let's pick back up. Here's the response. Then the fifth time, Sambalat, yep, like I said, fifth time. There were four of these before this, but the fifth time, Sambalat sent his aide to me with the same message. And in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt. And therefore, you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now, this report will get back to the king, so come, let us meet together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you're saying is happening. You're just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. One day, I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was shut in at his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. By night, they are coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambalot had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this. And then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. <clears throat> oh my. What is going on? Nehemiah is facing some opposition, some big opposition to this very good and wonderful project of God. So hold on a minute. What is opposition really? Well, I'm glad you guys asked that. You guys really ask really good questions, you know that? But let's take a look at that and be clear about it. Because if we're going to learn from Nehemiah how to deal with opposition to our own personal transformations and God's will that we want to work on, we're going to have to be clear. So for our purpose today, opposition is resistance that works against something, someone, or another group. Opposition is any resistance that directly tries to intervene against us. So why is this distinction important? Well, for example, to remember that opposition is not just disagreement. Like this. If someone says that peas taste better than chocolate chip cookies, I absolutely definitively disagree with them. My wife is shaking her head. Yes, she knows how I dislike peas. However, I'm not facing opposition in my disagreement. Yet, if that person walked into my house, though, and began throwing away all of my chocolate chip cookies and replace them with peas, well, there would be a little problem. But then I would be facing some opposition. Nowadays, I think many of us, the world, myself included, have a heightened tendency to make a disagreement into opposition. We become offended and angered easily. When, in fact, the Bible gives us some pretty clear instructions to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And whether that's political, social, spiritual, or cultural disagreement, we need to check ourselves to make sure we're not creating this great opposition in our minds where there's really just another perspective. But while we can call lesser things opposition, and it doesn't mean that opposition can't be more dangerous than peas versus cookies as well, because it can uh, we also need to realize that opposition can actually come from real evil. Jesus told us there was an evil one and that he would come to try and kill and destroy. And it's true. And yet, on the other hand, everyone who comes against us isn't evil. 
We live in a world where it's very easy to dehumanize someone and make them evil or a version of the devil. We like to categorize people as us versus them, as objects instead of people, especially when they're doing something that feels harmful to us. So let me remind you how Jesus lived. Jesus did not call every person that disagreed with him or even every person that opposed him evil. He identified evil for what it was, and also he saw others as humans who were wounded and broken. He met people that wanted to oppose him and offered them grace and truth. So let's not lose sight of seeing people as people, not as objects or evil, when they oppose us. Here's what else we can know about opposition. It's on the screen. Say it with me. Ready? Go. Opposition is inevitable. Yeah, isn't that the truth, though? No matter where we are or what we're trying to accomplish, whether it's in our relationships or our own soul, there will always be our own versions of Sambalots and Tobias that oppose it. Even Jesus knew it as he encouraged his disciples with these wise wise words. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So we're going to look at how Nehemiah navigated his opposition to discover a solid truth to hold on to, and it's this. When opposition rises up, I can trust God's power living inside me. Say that with me. Ready? Go. When opposition rises outside me, I can trust God's power living inside me. Now, I recently heard Pastor Taylor Brown, he was talking about Harriet Tubman. And so, the other day, I watched the movie Harriet. Movies are better than the Cliff Notes, just saying. Harriet is about the life of Harriet Tubman, and here's a picture of her. And now, she helped create and lead the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad was responsible for more than 300 people being delivered from slavery in the 1800s. Harriet was an illiterate slave who escaped, but she wasn't satisfied with just her own freedom. She wanted to help as many other people that were enslaved to be free as she could. So over the course of some say up to 19 trips, Harriet risked her life going back and forth to help people get free. Now, to watch this movie, it seemed impossible that she survived. Her life was constantly threatened, and she was always in danger of being caught and severely punished or killed. Now, there was such an urgency to catch her that slaveholders posted a $40,000 reward for her capture. That would be equal to about $1.5 million today. Yet, she continued to take trip after trip, bringing people to freedom and deliverance from their slavery. After that, in the Civil War, she led armed detachments, first woman to do so, and freed another 700 slaves. What kept her going? What kept Harriet focused on the task at hand? Here's what Harriet herself says. She believed the mission was bigger than just her. She said, my home, after all, was down in Maryland because my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters, and friends were there. But I was free, and they should be free. And Harriet had a deep faith that God would help her do this. Not even being able to read the warm Bible she carried with her, her faith carried her. When asked about how she kept on going in the face of difficulty and danger, and certainly opposition, this was Harriet's response. I said to the Lord, I'm going to hold steady on to you, and I know you will see me through. It was her loyalty to God and loyalty to a greater mission that helped Harriet press on in the face of great opposition. This was how she kept on going. See the movie if you haven't. It's really, really good. And this same loyalty to God and his plans, well, that's what kept Nehemiah going in the face of those who would betray and kill him and his people. Now, here's the deal. Any opposition you or I face today, it pales in comparison to the slavery that Harriet was facing or the enemies that were trying to attack Nehemiah. But we can learn a few things from them. Sambalot and Tobiah were, as we saw, 
vehemently opposed to Nehemiah's rebuilding project. They had some resentment going on. Why, you ask? There's another one of those good questions. They were part of two groups of peoples that God drove away from the promised land centuries before so that the Jews could settle there. They had a grudge going on. There was an axe to grind, and these two guys were going to grind it. So I want to give you three points today, or three ways that Nehemiah responded when he faced opposition. And these are things that we can or should do also. The first one is, don't remain the same, change your strategy. Don't remain the same, change your strategy. Albert Einstein defined sanity as doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Don't remain the same, change your strategy. This is a very practical thing. Uh, flexibility and the open-minded ability to pivot in the face of opposition, that can save us. Halfway through building the wall, opposition came to Nehemiah. He could have just thrown in the towel, or should I say trowel, uh, right then. But he didn't. Listen, someone right here might be in a season that seems like it is never-ending when it comes to opposition and trouble. Perhaps you can't see the light of day yet in building out of the rubble of your health, your relationships, your finances, maybe an addiction, whatever it is, you've started down the road and now you're around a bend and you can't see the end. Let me encourage you, give you hope, and tell you that opposition today does not, does not take away from God's goodness yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's still good and his grace is still working in your life. Keep on going. I've heard it said, the devil doesn't come after you when he's got you. He comes after you when you turn and go the other direction. Keep going. That's what Nehemiah did, and you can too. Now, Nehemiah gives us a beautiful picture of what it looks like to keep on going in the face of this attack. While trusting in God's power, he changes his strategy to match the opposition he was facing. Same thing is true with you and me when we face opposition. Sometimes, our strategy just has to change based on the opposition that we're facing. Instead of doing it one way, we need to do it another. So what is your strategy shift that needs to happen? You know, maybe you've been trying to rebuild a relationship by your own force, and you need to shift to the humble way of Jesus instead. You know, maybe it's an addiction, and you need to begin to work a program of recovery. Maybe you're trying to rebuild your finances, and it's time to adjust your priorities in line with God's heart. Maybe instead of always looking for a fight or conflict at work, uh, you can love and serve others like Jesus did. Now, I'm not sure what strategy needs to shift for you, but I'm willing to guess that something has to change. So notice the phrase that Nehemiah says to mark this change. It's the one in red. From that day on, from that day on, signified a change in responding to opposition. There comes a point when each of us has that from that day on moment for ourselves. It's where we decide that we're ready to try a new way of doing things and change our strategy to better live into the focus God has given us and his will. Now, I regularly tell you folks around here that I'm in 12-step recovery from addiction to alcohol and drugs, and my from that day on moment was September 20th, 2013. That's my sobriety date. Thank you. you know, but you need to think about what is your from that day on moment. Here's the second point, or what else we can do to trust God's power inside us in the face of opposition, and it's this. Don't retaliate, respond in prayer. Don't retaliate, respond in prayer. Just about the only thing missing from Nehemiah's opposition story is some revenge. No matter how often Nehemiah faced opposition, he chose not to retaliate, even when it would have been easy to say they deserved it, you know, that justified retaliation. No, Nehemiah didn't give them the same that they were giving him. It was an example of the teaching Jesus would give many years later to love your enemies and pray for them. In fact, that was Nehemiah's response instead of retaliation. Prayer. Here's a reminder of what Nehemiah said after the second form of opposition. It's in red, and say it with me. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. 
Now, if you've ever needed to pray and didn't quite know what to say, uh, strengthen my hands might be a really good start. Maybe instead of occupying your mind with dreams about getting even with them, uh, you can fill it with thoughts about giving grace to them. Spend time praying for strength for you and for God's grace to lead and guide them. So we've been having some testimonies in this series of people who have faced similar things that Nehemiah has. Uh, Today is a very special day for me because I would like to invite my lovely wife Gwen up here because she has faced some definite opposition and she's going to tell us how God helped her to overcome it, how things changed for her as she kept faithful. So let's give Gwen a big hand. Good morning, Grace Church. I want to ask you all right now a question. Have you ever prayed to God and felt like you got your uh, prayers answered quickly or maybe you had them answered? Let me see a raise of hands. Good, good. Well, how many of you in here have ever felt like you prayed to God and you didn't get an answer? That you prayed for a very long time and you're still waiting? <laughs> yeah. I waited 15 years. 15 years I prayed that God would change Kip's heart. It was a long time. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me just share a little bit about before Kip. See, I was married before, and uh, one day my husband had told me he no longer wanted to be with me. So he was leaving me, and I had a one, three, and seven-year-old and what happened was he ended up doing something and he went to prison for 13 years. When he went to prison, I had the IRS, the SEC, the feds at my door. I was uh, possibly going to go to prison too because I had to go before a grand jury. My life just unfolded. I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no house, no bed, no car, nothing. I had three small children, and I was struggling. But what happened was God got me through that. I took action. I started to get back on my feet. I started to work. And as I was working, I met my husband, and that was Kip. I met him on Love, AOL Love, which is no longer there, a dating site. <laughs> So I did meet him on a dating site. And he had three girls. I had three girls. I thought, this is great. He didn't drink. He didn't smoke. I thought, man, this is even better. But then, as our time went on, he started drinking Old Duels. And then he started drinking beer. That led to other things. And it started leading to women. Now, when he had his first affair, I was devastated, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to buy you a boat because I'm codependent, and I wanted to keep him. And so as we worked things out, I all of a sudden, uh, he had another affair. I buy him a Corvette this time, <laughs> thinking, I want him. I want him to love me. What's wrong with me? Well, as we were going through all of this stuff, of course, um, I had other things that happened. My mom died, which was my best friend. And then my youngest daughter wanted to commit suicide because her father had gotten out of prison, and he said he wanted nothing to do with them. She was devastated. And then, of course, the recession hit. And I had 12 real estate offices. I had worked my way back up, and I, again, lost everything for the second time. I lost my car, my house, I lost everything. Not only that, um, you know, I was still struggling with Kip. But God remembered my prayer, remember? It took 15 years, but God remembered. And when he 
uh, changed Kip's heart. I saw a change. He started going to church with me. He started working a program, Choose Recovery. He came here. He started also giving his life to God. I start seeing a change. But I also needed to work on me. I was still struggling with my codependency, my wanting to please. And God got me involved at Choose Recovery here in the codependency. Um, also, I serve here. I help out in the kitchen team on Monday nights. God's been working on me. And last week, I was at Kairos outside. It's for women who have loved ones that's in prison. I was able to finally let go of the anger, of the hurt that I felt, the struggle. Because, see, Nehemiah, as we've been studying about Nehemiah, you know, we've been watching him where he had a vision and he went to God and he prayed and he wanted to build that wall and God listened to him. Our life is the same way. All of us in this room have had a struggle. Some of us have had loss of family members. We've lost, we've been in, in a divorce. We've had situations happen. All of us here. See, I could have easily given up and stayed in my pit. I could have easily given up hope and not got back up. Because I had those feds at the door. I had newspaper crews. I had NBC, ABC at my door. I had death threats. It was not a fun time. But God did something inside me. He allowed me to get up and have hope. And just like Kip was talking about Harriet, let's think about her. She was a slave that was born into slavery. She had no choice, but she did have a choice to get up and have freedom, right? She made that choice. We all have a choice. We all can sit back. But guess what happened? Think about Harriet. She not only wanted to get herself out, but she wanted to get her family out of there. She went back to her family, and guess what? Her sister said, I want to stay. Her sister did not come back with her. She stayed in that pit. See, that's a choice that each of us have right today is whether we want to stay there and stay stuck because, look, I could have easily gave up. I could have easily said, you know what? I've had it, God. I can't take any more of this pain that I'm feeling. But I didn't. I got back up. I said, I can do it with God's help. All of us have a choice. We have a choice to rebuild. The choice is yours today. Whether you want to stay stuck or whether you want to get up and fight the fight with God and have him just be all in with you. That choice is you. So make that choice today because it works. It works. It works. So please, all I can say to you in that opposition don't stay stuck. Work it. God bless you all. You're welcome. Uh, give Gwen another hand. I feel little naked though. Those of you in recovery, it's almost like I shared my fifth step up here, right? But I freely share my story with people because it's a story of redemption and the power of what God can do. You know, when we take, as Gwen said, when we take action, I had to take action on my part and trust God. It was that full surrender. I mean, Gwen talked about that, uh, you know, I know right before I got sober, she threw her hands up in prayer and said, I, that's it. After 15 years, she says, I'm done. That, that was her um, from this moment on. That w and that's when I got sober finally. Um, but, you know, I definitely married up. Amen? <laughs> and Gwen preached the rest of my sermon for me. So that's awesome. 
But because here's the third point, or way that Nehemiah responded when he faced opposition, and it's how Gwen responded and how we need to respond. And it's don't retreat, run to the Father, not from your mission. Don't retreat, run to the Father, not from your mission. Listen, God has a plan for you and the rebuild you need in your own life. He's got a plan. And I can guarantee you, his plan is much better than any that we come up with. Uh, you can trust that. He needs you faithful to trudge. The word trudge means walk with purpose. You know, so be faithful to trudge through the opposition you're facing or that you will face. Harriet Tubman's very life was threatened and she held fast because she knew what she was doing was God's will for her. Gwen held fast and stayed faithful. Like she said, she prayed for 15 years for me to step up and be the spiritual head of the family. Honey, did you ever think that we'll be up here on a stage sharing a message together on a Sunday morning? She's shaking her head no if you can't see her. Yeah, that's all. Uh, only, only by God. You know, Nehemiah's very life was threatened and he felt held fast because he heard from God that rebuilding Jerusalem was the thing to do. So as the band makes their way back up here, listen to what Nehemiah said. But I said, should a man like me run away or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? He said, I will not go. I will not go. Here's what Nehemiah is saying. You're not getting rid of me that easy. Gwen said the same thing. And here's the deal for you and me. If God leads you to it, God will see you through it. I like that one, right? If God leads you to it, God will see you through it. You can bet your life on it, but you can't do it alone. You'll need to run to the Father and cling to the Son and rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. So here's how we need to respond. Number one, don't remain the same. Change your strategy. Number two, don't retaliate. Respond in prayer. And number three, don't retreat. Run to the Father not from your mission. Now, for some of us here, God has tapped us on the shoulder and called us to something. Maybe it's to go to a certain place, to serve in a certain way, to reconcile a relationship, to do something new, to love in a new way, and the list goes on and on. And maybe we've thought about retreating or running away from it all. You faced opposition, and it just seems too much. You know, I want to encourage you today and give you that hope to not retreat from God's will. Don't quit, change it up, don't hit back, but keep praying. Don't run from what you're called to. Instead, run to God, carry that with you, let him embrace you, and let him carry you through. He'll be with you in the journey. In a moment, we're going to open the altar up here to let you come and pray. If you're joining us online, make where you're at a place of prayer as well. Please stand and join me in prayer. Father God, thank you for the stories in the Bible, the story of Nehemiah and how he was rebuilding the wall and how that speaks to us in our heart and how we can rebuild our life. You know, let us change our strategy, respond in prayers we're doing now, and let us run to you, Father, not away from you, but run to you, not from your mission. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The altar is open. Mm -hmm.